Today is Wednesday, May the 9th, 2012. Welcome to Fix My Electronics. If you're not familiar with the show, our presenters discuss topics and demonstrate techniques related to the wonderful world of electronics. From night to night, that can mean repairing a cassette player, configuring a router, or simply introducing the tools of the trade to the hobbyist and DIYer in all of us. Presenting tonight are Stephen Tecnico Lotto Medina, William Maestro Della Luce, Gabriel, and Jeffrey Freeman. Sorry, Jeffrey, uh, terrible Italian accents take all my creative nicknaming skills right out of me. <laughs> and working the buttons and levers under the cover of darkness is yours truly, Chad uh, LaFarge. Good Star Wars guy. <laughs> <laughs> On tonight's agenda, we're going to uh, lead off with William, who's going to demonstrate a laser light show, followed by... Jeffrey, who will teach us the fundamental types of electronic circuits. It's going to be shocking. Apologies to the viewers for that awful pun. Before we get moving, I wanted to introduce Stephen, the creator of Fix My Electronics. Stephen, can you tell us a little about yourself and what you're trying to achieve here? Uh, well, I'm trying to basically create a movement uh, where us as community members can make a difference and can actually get people to wake up and realize that we have an e-waste problem. And if, if we don't, you know, take care of that problem and actually acknowledge what's going on in 20 years from now, it's going to be way worse. And by us being able to work as a community and fix electronics as a group, that's just maybe going to be able to limit the amount of e-waste that we have now. Uh, that's just basically um, my goal is to have an electronics boys and girls club uh, where we can actually have a place, uh, learn, recycle, do it all. Outstanding. Outstanding. Uh, thank you, sir. I'll ask that each of the presenters also take a moment to introduce themselves before they get into their presentation so that we have an idea of who they are and, and where they're coming from. And with that, let's meet William. William, what's your background and what inspired you to learn what you know? Well, I guess my background has always been electronics. I come from a family of electricians, and so we've always liked to play with things that, uh, that interest us in power and such things like that, I guess. Um, my first project was a Radio Shack and antenna kit when I was about five years old, and ever since then I was hooked. Um, I pretty much spent the rest of my life researching and trying to build all kinds of different electronic devices, uh, whatever I thought was interesting. And uh, I guess today I'm going to show you a laser spirograph that I built by hand, um, aside from the Arduino microcontroller and the control shield and the other miscellaneous products. Um, pretty much put it all together myself. Um, so I guess I can get into just showing you the setup right now. Please. Now before you uh, click any buttons or anything like that, what are the safety concerns when working with lasers? Uh, the main concern with working with lasers is getting hit in the eye by a laser beam, either directly or indirectly, can cause severe damage. Um, I'd say anything over the power of, say, 20 milliwatts can cause damage to the eye. Um, anything over that can cause severe damage to the eye instantaneously. Um, it only would take a second for you to uh, suffer the repercussions of being hit by a laser uh, directly in the eye. Uh, reflections are also con a concern because reflections can also uh, contain quite a bit of power um, even in a reflection and still cause a lot of damage to, uh, to your eyes. That's why you should always wear your laser safety goggles. Um, you want to make sure that they are rated for the wavelength that you're dealing with. Uh, the different wavelengths, each one has a different coating for each wavelength on the goggles themselves. You want to make sure you're wearing them at all times when uh, performing any kind of projects with lasers. Uh, Where did you get yours? Uh, I ordered mine online. There's uh, several different uh, retailers available if you just 
you know, if you look up general laser safety or you look up, uh, uh, you know, laser equipment, laser parts, uh, you can find that they also sell the proper protective gear for the wavelength that you're dealing with. Um, the, the goggles can be a little bit expensive sometimes. I'd say you're looking at spending at least over $100 for a good set. Um, it's worth it. You only have one pair of eyes, and even one stray hit can cause permanent blindness for the rest of your life, so it's worth it to spend the money. <laughs> so, so don't calibrate with the naked eye is, is what we're trying to say. Uh, yeah, never, never even power up any kind of laser optic at all without uh, uh, safety, without eye protection ever. Pretty much uh, never. Any wavelength at great powers can cause severe damage to, you know, whether it's uh, red, blue, green, yellow, it doesn't, the color isn't really the factor. It's more or less the wavelengths and the power uh, that's used. Even an uh, infrared laser can, that you can't even see could permanently damage your eye and you'd never even know the beam was in front of your face. Yeah, I had no idea that that was a, a concern. I'm glad that you brought that up. Okay, we, how, how close are we to showtime there? Um, I can start powering it up right now. Beautiful. As a matter of fact, awesome. what I'm going to do is I'm going to go dark here um, and then reposition the camera in the proper place and fire it up. Good deal. Well, this is a single motor spinning at uh, probably just a couple hundred RPM right now. As, as I start ramping it up, I'll get into the, uh, the uh, second, third, and fourth motors. Wow, that is awesome. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Now you, you mentioned motors. And and I, go ahead, Stephen. No, no, go ahead. Um, I was just going to ask him, um, what exactly um, is he turning up? I'm turning up the uh, potentiometers that control each DC motor's uh, voltage to make them either rotate faster or slower. Okay, now you've mentioned motors twice, and I've heard of different people having different laser setups uh, with servos controlling mirrors or motors controlling mirrors. Obviously, you're, you're, you've chosen motors here. Is that because and what of would the be speed? the application for this? What surface are you doing that on now? Is this on a monitor? This is actually just on a painted wall with a simple flat uh, wall right now. It's currently probably about, say, 17 to 20 feet away, somewhere like that from the camera mm -hmm. right now, the laser assembly. And okay. it's, do you, uh, it's in projecting. What, what uh, use do you envision for this? It's, it's real use and function, I guess, would be just for entertainment more than anything. Um, mm -hmm. This is actually a very, uh, very uh, kind of low-grade way to make images like this with the laser using just uh, standard DC motors and fixed mirrors. Um, if you wanted to get more elaborate, you would build a uh, laser scanner, which, which uses uh, a different hardware setup to project the images. They're actually uh, galvometers, so they're more or less kind of like a, I guess they would almost be like a, uh, instead of a DC motor, it would be almost like a stepper motor with uh, mirrors attached. Uh, this is simply for DC motors spinning at different rates, different RPM rates at uh, opposite revolutions to create the geometric patterns. 
Now, I've seen sort of uh, light shows where you could react to noise uh, levels. Do you know, if, are there artists using this yet, or are you the first one out the, uh, out the gate with this? No, this is a pretty rudimentary, I guess, uh, basic kind of um, <coughs> a laser hobby setup for making geographic images like this. There's uh, tons of devices that utilize the same, uh, same type of setup for entertainment, the different types of laser uh, arrays. There are, and I could obviously do that to this model, where I can make it react to audio. Um, I could set uh, the potentiometers to react to different frequencies of sound using the Arduino microcontroller to monitor those frequencies. And it would constantly change the image based on the frequency responses. So um, you would get different geometric patterns based on the frequencies that it received and how it interpreted that. Um, to the DC motors themselves. That's awesome. That's pretty neat. And you, you mentioned a couple of times um, the Arduino board that you're using. Yes. Um, talk to us a little bit about that if you can. What I'm using right now is a uh, Arduino Uno. It's uh, I think version 3 right now. It's your standard uh, Arduino microcontroller. Uh, it's probably the best starter uh, basic um, Arduino you could uh, use. There are larger models and a little bit more powerful, but uh, for a hobbyist, this is perfect. Um, so as far as the Arduino goes, it's pretty much yeah. your run-of-the-mill standard uh, Arduino Uno. It has, I think, uh, 16 digital inputs, um, I think six analog inputs. And it's fairly easy to control using the uh, Arduino software uh, for drawing, drawing up sketches and programs. Mm -hmm. I, I see two uses. Excuse me, Steve, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Steve. Oh, I see two, uh, right off the bat, I see two ways that this could be implemented. I can see artists going crazy for this because they, they're really into light stuff, uh, some of them. Uh, but also, I see it as an uh, architectural adjunct that uh, as, long, as long as you had it high enough and away from people's eyeballs, you could actually keep it, instead of having paintings on the wall, you could have, this is a form of uh, living art, in fact. And yeah. uh, from an art, be fabulous. I do use this. Um, I also work on a lot of audio equipment as well, and I also am... Uh, an experimental musician, and I actually do use this exact setup at shows. Mm -hmm. uh, I do projected and oh, good. Um, playing. And we talked briefly about it being able to uh, adapt it to respond to different noise levels. You could also do something with ultrasonic distance sensors where proximity to it would change it, uh, where somebody moving their hand in, in front of a, a beam of light would be able to measure the difference in uh, the distance and change the display. That, that's pretty wild, man. Yeah, using that's the uh, advantage of using the microcontroller is you, you know you're able to expand on a simple project like this and be able to give it you know some type of input and also produce some type of feedback from that input. You know you could go as far as using even uh, you know a Bluetooth shield or a GPS shield and it would also react to uh, you know certain things being far away or being close or being reported in, I could, you know, potentially report into this device, uh, even using a Wi-Fi shield from down the street and be able to either control it or implement, you know, programming data to make it do what I want it to, even from mm -hmm. a remote distance. Right. Uh, now, you know, of course, on my screen, this looks like about three inches by two inches. <laughs> How big can you make this, these designs? Uh, the size of the image usually depends on uh, two things. One would be the, the mirror size, the size of the mirrors you're using to project onto, um, mm -hmm. and also the power of the laser. The, the power is probably the most important factor when uh, speaking of going a great distance, because you need, uh, mm -hmm. you need that light to be more concentrated so it can travel a further distance as a tight, uh, compact package mm -hmm. to be able to create the beam. Now, everything size, I see is, yeah, excuse me, continue. The mirror size isn't uh, greatly important. You can get away even, say, say you could use 
uh, two-inch mirrors, and with a, a powerful enough laser, you'd still be able to see that from quite a, quite a great distance, say, um, depending on the power, you'd see it from 100 feet away, 300 feet away. It really just depends on the power of the laser you're using mm -hmm. and what type of uh, optics. So you can I have two more pretty questions. Bright First thing is, how big is feet? this image on your wall? And is blue its only color? Uh, this is actually, you're seeing blue, and it's actually an ultraviolet. This is projecting at uh, 405 nanometers. So to me, it looks mm -hmm. like a, uh, looks almost like a purple. And it's, it's a strange color. When you, when you see this with the naked eye, it looks uh, very different from what you're seeing on your computer screen. Your, your eyes shouldn't actually be cap capable of even seeing the image. It, it's just that the, the, the photons are compacted and are, and, and are so powerful that you're able to, your eyes are able to you know, perceive some type of image there. Um, I'm actually going to ramp it up right now and give it a little bit more power and we'll see how bright it gets. Um, it's a little dangerous. It might uh, kill the laser diode, but let's do it. Sounds like fun. Have you tried using uh, laser sensitive papers like the x ray sensitive photo plates are really sensitive to x rays and and we see images on x ray x ray plates like that. Have you tried using laser sensitive papers to to see if these images can be reproduced on papers? It would be fantastic art. I'm not sure if he's. If, oh, you can hear me. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not I mean, I've never tried that. It does sound like an interesting idea. I think the hard part would be um, like this: getting an image to stay stable enough um, that it wouldn't override itself and just kind of make a big mess. So you would probably want the image to be kind of stable. The image you're actually seeing now is a bit different than the image that I see. Um, it's similar, but the, the detail in it, it it's actually. It actually looks three-dimensional. The camera gets a lot of splash. You see a lot of a blue, kind of a blue halo around it. Um, in real life, you don't, you don't see any of that actually at all. Um, a lot of that's just the laser playing tricks on the camera. But for me, this image is almost three-dimensional where I can walk out and touch it. Uh, can you uh, review the equipment you're using uh, with us quickly? Yeah, can we turn on the lights and take a look at your gear? Let me go ahead and uh, power it. Now the Arduino that he was talking about is, is essentially a hobbyist level board. Um, mm -hmm. It's a it's a easy entryway into working with microcontrollers. I've worked with them myself on, on a number of small projects. And it uses a like a, a stripped down subset of C, which I I, can, I feel like it's more like typing out JavaScript, you know, programming the Arduino. Yeah, it wasn't too hard to get a get a, a, a round on. Um, some of my programming is in different areas, uh, mostly with Crestron systems, Lutron systems, basically like lighting control systems and control systems for audio video which are a bit different, but uh, I found that um, this was actually easy to, to uh, easy concept to grasp right away and, and really start working after just a few tutorials. And uh, that, that microcontroller is actually down here at the base. Uh, on top of that is a Adafruit Industries uh, servo DC motor controller shield. It's actually supplying the power to the DC motors themselves here um, and the laser uh, driver and diode array itself. Um, it's actually also being powered by a uh, power supply to power the entire shield and the motors. The Arduino Uno is being powered by uh, USB currently. Uh, I, I tend to keep the two separately powered that way because anytime I'm working, especially on the shield, if I goof something up, I don't want it to affect the uh, Arduino Uno in any way. That could be negative. That makes sense. So those are the four motors, and they've got... Uh, that was great. What size motors nice. did you say are on there? 
These are fairly small DC motors. These run at about, I think, uh, 3 volts minimum to about 12 volts maximum. They're rated at, I think, 7,200 RPM a piece is what they're rated at. Um, and I'm driving them at probably about 9 volts. So it's kind of somewhere in the middle, um, just so I don't make everything go too crazy. Um, when you start to, to get up, you start to approach speeds upwards of 10,000 RPM, a setup like this um, could, could almost rip itself apart based on the speed the, if any of the, the, um, the mirrors you know, fail and fly off one of the DC motors. It could crash into the others and um, it could be kind of dangerous. So I don't try to go too fast with it. And those are one-inch mirrors? Um, I have various sizes. This, the very front mirror is a one-inch mirror. Um, I actually start at a fairly small mirror. I'd say it's probably about a quarter, quarter inch, and then I have half inch to half inch, and then up to a one-inch mirror. Um, basically, as you start to project the laser onto the mirrors, um, you get a lot of distortion from the mirrors, um, from the laser optics. So as you gradually uh, go up in size, it helps with the, the final image. So you're not trying to squeeze it all into such a small mirror for your exit, where uh, you'll get a lot of splash over from the sides of the mirror, and it'll look terrible. Okay. And these are actually are currently just uh, regular standard coated mirrors um, for a professional setup you'd want to go with um, you'd want to go with a different you want to go with front front surface mirrors which basically means the the coating for the mirror is actually on the front versus the back so you get a lot less distortion um, this is basically when I set this one up it was merely for proof of concept and I might go ahead and um, install the proper mirrors on on a better mounting surface um, to get a better image but but for now I'm just kind of having fun playing with it that's outstanding. Uh, did you want to give a shot at uh, showing us the um, Arduino, the IDE? Um, yeah, I can, I can give that a shot. Actually, it looks like I have it closed. Maybe I can... Really putting William on the, the spot here. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've, we're occupying your whole evening with just your demo because lasers are just too cool. You don't by any chance have any sharks. I don't. It would be nice, though, because if I did, I would definitely attach a few lasers to them. Yeah, that, that'd be a great upgrade. I can go ahead and uh, try to get, a, get a, a screen share of this now, see how, see how it works out for you guys. This is basically the uh, sketch that's written in the Arduino. Okay. I can read it a little bit in the Hangout. It's kind of fuzzy on YouTube. But um, we could get through the logic. If, if you want to look through some, uh, some code blocks and walk through the logic of how it's driving the motors and deciding what to do, would you mind doing that? Oh, no problem. I guess uh, from the start here, you have your motors called out um, as motors 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, and you have your basic uh, setup for talking, um, your serial. And the main loop, I guess what's happening here is you have your sensor reading 1, 2, 3, 4, the sensors being the potentiometers themselves. Um, so basically the entire time the Arduino is, is looking for a reading from each one of these potentiometers. The way it interprets that is um, a map sensor value. So uh, what you have here is you have your motor speed, one, two, three, four, which be, would be your DC motors. Mm -hmm. And that would equal the, the sensor reading from 0 um, to uh, 1032, 0, 255. These values are pretty generic values. Um, but that basically gives it a base to start from. Um, it basically tells it the motor speed equals this reading. So um, from the beginning, you're, 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 uh, you're reading the sensor, then you're interpreting that to a device um, that you had called out previously in your include for the DC motor, one, two, three, four. Um, so that's just using four pins on the Arduino for the motors. Um, 
Correct, yeah, for the for the analog read portion of it, um, for the potentiometer. Pulse width modulation? Uh, no, um, basically the four potentiometers are uh, at, they're set as analog inputs. Uh, that's why you have to have the sensor reading value set mm -hmm. because you're kind of basing it around a potentiometer value. In this case, oh. I'm basing it around a, a 5K potentiometer value. So. Um, uh, that's what I. That's what's based on the sensor values and set speed variables is based upon these potentiometers in an analog read pin. Um, the the Adafruit Industries uh, motor shield actually takes up most of the uh, the digital in and out. So they take. They're basically taking most of the PWM uh, digital pins to drive the motors and to uh, drive the circuit itself. Uh, that makes sense. And for each of the uh, run four motors at assigned speeds, um, what you're doing is you're telling it if if this, then do that. So if motor speeds greater than zero, you're telling it to run forward at the set speed. That set speed would be the set speed of the sensor, meaning how how the Arduino interprets uh, the values that you set for reading the sensor. Um, so that would be, you know, simple as where where the potentiometer is located from, uh, you know, full stop all the way to the other stop, I guess. And then uh, after that, you have your you basically just have your serial your serial print. Um, it's a place to kind of debug. You can uh, remove the comment marks and and um, you can run the debugger serial monitor. And what that would do is basically give you a, it'll give you what the output reading, the potentiometer values are. And as you're um, watching the motor spin, you can kind of fine tune those values if you need to. Um, if you have to set the delay down at the very bottom, the delay set at about 100, which is isn't that's not instantaneous. It's probably about there's probably about a maybe two to three second lag in between the time that you turn the potentiometer and the value is implemented. Now, how many lines of code do you have there? Oh, not many. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's pretty, it's, actually, it's very small. This is a very, very uh, simple, basic um, sketch. I'm, I'm seeing like less than 200 lines of code, I, I think, far less probably than 200 lines of code. And to, to do that kind of display, I think that's pretty awesome that, that you can do all that with that short file. That was kind of the idea uh, between myself and um, my business partner that actually helped out on the code was to try to make it as simple as possible so we would have more room to expand upon the project if we needed to versus having you know this this huge muddled piece of of code that would just get this working the way we wanted it to and then have to go through and clean it up when we wanted to make changes or add other devices this way. Um, it's, it's set up simple and clear. Uh, you know what pins are being used for what, um, and you know what you have left to, to work with. So then if, if I do want to expand on this, it's easy to expand on later on. I don't have to remember you know, all kinds of weird tricks and things that I did to get around um, certain fixes or uh, to get it the way that I wanted to. Okay. And can agree or disagree with the statement, if you've ever made a web page, you can probably very easily write a sketch in Arduino for Arduino. Yes. Um, it, it's probably one of, it's, it's one of the simplest projects I've ever done. Um, I was curious about it for a while when it first came out. Uh, I, I didn't put very much time into it, and I'd say about, about nine months ago, I decided it was time to kind of take a look at it. Um, I, I'm more of a fan of analog components, so I like trying to build things um, that are the too elaborate hardware-wise and, 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 and a lot more dumbed down. And I thought that this was a, a good happy medium between uh, people like myself that may try to stay away from too many digital things and want to try to stick towards analog devices. And um, I think almost just about anyone who's even, uh, who's even computer savvy can, can obviously, I think, harness uh, Arduino code very easily just with a few tutorials and would be on their way uh, with designing whatever kind of cool devices that they could dream up. Outstanding, outstanding. Well, I love the laser light show. That was fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. And thanks for putting us on your, your desktop. I'll try and 
move away from that so we don't see you clicking around. <laughs> and let's let's go on to Jeffrey. Jeffrey, be honest. You just wanted to learn electronics because the ladies dig a guy with a grounding strap. Entirely true. I didn't know how you found out. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, I've been doing electronics since uh, I was probably 10 years old, uh, at least having fun with it, doing what I could do. Um, I do uh, both software and hardware for a living. Uh, I run a company called Synclius, uh, we do artificial intelligence and evolutionary algorithms. Part of the thing I spend a lot of time doing is uh, stuff like evolvable hardware and uh, other types of protocols on the software level that can ultimately run on the hardware level, uh, stuff like hardware acceleration, uh, deal with GPUs and uh, stuff like that as well, but that's more for simulation, and then uh, FPGAs uh, for the evolvable hardware, stuff like that. So uh, most of the stuff that I'm doing is probably going to be beyond the scope of what I'll be discussing today, but uh, it's definitely a lot of fun, and I've been doing this kind of stuff for over a decade now. Outstanding, outstanding. What the topic that you were going to bring to us tonight was just the fundamental electronic circuits, the way that circuits can be described. Is that correct? Yeah, um, I'm going to go over, uh, I'm going to start with uh, two of the most basic types of uh, circuits, and then I'm going to move on to um, a little bit about how you would go about analyzing those types of circuits, and hopefully it'll give you a, a nice foundation as to how to look at the different parts of any type of a circuit and ultimately it's a lead into doing a circuit analysis on more complex circuits. So it's really the, the foundation that you would need to understand how to analyze circuits and uh, covers both series and parallel type circuits. Good deal. Let's take a look. All right. Um, you, uh, you'll have the diagrams that you'll be showing as I go through it, so um, I do. I'll rely, uh, rely on you and we'll, uh, we'll start right off with uh, figure one, which uh, shows one of the two basic types of circuits, which is yeah, series and parallel. Uh, figure one shows a, a series type circuit, which is really a, a very simple type of circuit where every component is chained together in a series, which is why it's called a series. Um, so that diagram kind of shows you a, a basic idea of what a schematic would look like. Each one of those rectangles can represent any sort of component. Uh, you can just think of it as a resistor, but really any component in there would still qualify as a series circuit, and for everything I'm talking about, you can just assume these blocks are pretty much any sort of a circuit, it doesn't matter. Uh, and that plus minus represents a battery here, but again, all the logic I'll be going over, really, it, it could all be components, it doesn't necessarily need to refer to a, a battery in a particular component in a particular circuit. Um, now, if you look at figure two, uh, that is a parallel type circuit, which is where each one of the components are well hooked in parallel, where they're all stringed together uh, in such that you have two ends each component and all of one end is connected together on one side of the components and the other side is connected together. So you wind up having this parallel type architecture. Uh, now next I'm going to show you how circuits can include obviously both series and parallel and that's in figure three you'll notice um, a very simple hybrid circuit which is where you have um, the one section which is the series uh, type circuit that I showed you in figure one uh, kind of combined with the parallel type circuit in figure two. So obviously circuits can uh, be much more than just simple series or parallel but ultimately contain series and parallel elements which is very important for when you start analyzing it because you tend to analyze the series elements slightly different than the parallel elements which is ultimately what I'm going to be getting into how you would go about looking at these types of circuits and uh, figuring out what the voltage and current would be at certain points in the circuit, which is ultimately what you're trying to do when you do any form of circuit analysis to begin with. Uh, if you look at figure four, this is where we start getting into how we break down these hybrid type circuits that contain series and parallel elements. Um, you have something called two types of analysis that you do, uh, mesh analysis and nodal analysis. In mesh analysis, you're basically analyzing the series components of the circuit. So in figure four, you look at four different examples of meshes inside that circuit. And a mesh is pretty much any portion of the circuit you can create a loop around. Uh, so here are three separate meshes within that hybrid circuit that I'll show you in a minute how we would go about analyzing uh, an individual mesh and therefore the circuit as a whole. Um, in figure five, you'll see how we identify nodes in a circuit. And a node is basically any uh, point in the circuit 
that connects various components together. So we, we have two different examples of nodes in that same hybrid circuit in figure five, where we have the first uh, node basically connects together uh, five different components. So nodes can connect anywhere from two components to any number of components. And the second node in that uh, in figure five shows a node that just connects two components together. So you can have a lot of variation in how many components can be connected from a single node. And obviously, um, when you do an analysis of this type of a circuit, you would have to combine mesh analysis and nodal analysis, which I'm going to get into next. And this is uh, where you'll see some of the math. In figure six, um, you'll see basically where we take an individual mesh, which if you look at the original hybrid uh, circuit, this is basically just one of the meshes out of that circuit. Whenever you have a circuit, you can take any mesh in the entire circuit. And one thing that holds true for it is that the voltage drop, if you add all the voltage drops across all the components within that mesh, it should add up to zero. So in this case, we have uh, V1, V2, V3, and V4, which are individual voltage drops. And basically, by a voltage drop, we mean you take a multimeter, stick it on the, the voltage recording, run your circuit, and hook it up to these individual components and read what it is. The red dot represents where you would hook the negative probe, and the green dot represents where you'd hook the positive probe. Uh, in this particular circuit, assuming C2, C3, and C4 were resistors, what you'd wind up getting is V1 would be a positive value, and V2, V3, and V4 would all be negative values, because they're the voltage drops across the resistor. You'll notice that if you add up V2, V3, and V4, it would equal V5. So when you take a bunch of components in series and add them together, you're going to get the voltage drop across that group of components. So just like we can say V1 plus V2 plus V3 plus V4 all equals zero, we can also say V1 plus V5 is going to equal zero, which makes perfect sense because all you're really doing is taking the voltmeter, measuring it one direction, then flipping the probes around and measuring it the other direction in that particular case. So it makes sense why that would equal zero. And by extension, it, it makes some bit of sense why V1, V2, V3, and V4 would all equal zero. Um, now, just to, as a small segue for those of you who aren't intimately familiar with voltage and current, uh, a nice easy way to think of voltage is if you have two points in the circuit, voltage is similar to the, the difference in pressure between those two points if electricity was think, thought of as an analog of water. Um, so voltage is similar to the pressure difference between two points in the circuit, whereas current actually represents the quantity of electricity flowing through a particular point in the circuit. So that, that, that just gives you a little better way of understanding voltage and current and explains also why with voltage you're measuring two points in the circuit and with current you're representing a single point in the circuit because you're representing the, the electricity that flows through it. Um, now I want to go into, oh, and in figure six we're looking at basically what we call mesh analysis. So that's how you would do an analysis on a particular mesh. Uh, the current running through every point in this particular circuit in figure six is going to be the same. Uh, so no matter which node you measure for the current in this particular example, you're going to get the same value, which is why when you're looking at meshes, you typically look at the voltages, and when you look at nodes, you're typically looking at the current, which brings us to the next uh, example, which is going to be figure seven. In figure seven, we're showing basically what's um, nodal analysis, where we're looking at a parallel circuit, and we want to analyze what the current is at the various points, I1 to I8, is basically the different points in the circuit where you can measure current. Now we only have one point where we can measure voltage, which is V1. Uh, the voltage across all those components is going to be identical in this case, because they're all connected to the same wire, obviously. <clears throat> now when we look at nodal analysis, what we care about is that all of the current entering into a node is going to equal all the current that exits out of that node. So in this case, I1 is going to equal the sum of I2, I3, and I4 because I1 ha is where the current goes in, and I2, 3, and 4 is where it comes out. So in this case, we can say I1 is going to be equal to the sum of I1, I2, I, or I1 is going to be equal to the sum of I2, I3, and I4, as well as equal to the sum of I5, I6, and I7, which is also going to be equal to I8, which is shown there in the, uh, the first equation. In addition, I2 is going to be equal to I5, I3 is going to be equal to I6, and I4 is going to be equal to I7. So from this, what we're able to do is we're able to determine um, what the current is going in and out of a particular node. And through that, we can do uh, nodal analysis. 
Now, when you have a hybrid type uh, circuit, which is what you were seeing in uh, figure three earlier, you can notice that we want to combine these things. So we would do a mesh analysis with the series component, obviously, and the nodal analysis with the two nodes. And by doing that, we would be able to then analyze what the current and voltage is in any point of the circuit at any point in time. And this is called time domain analysis. So when we're doing this kind of stuff, what we're going to do is we're going to plug in um, an equation for the voltage drops across the one mesh that's in series. And then we're also going to add two equations for each one of the nodes in that particular uh, schematic, that particular uh, electronic design. And from that, you arrive with three separate equations, two equations for each node and one equation for that one particular mesh. And from those three equations, you can basically have uh, what's called in mathematics simultaneous equations. They basically three equations that have variables that overlap with each other. And from that, you can create um, a single equation that's no longer simultaneous, so you can actually have a mathematical function that will tell you what the voltage and current is at any point in the circuit. Now this can get really complex when instead of talking about just resistors, we start talking about things like capacitors and inductors and things like that. But for now, these simple principles is what is the foundation for everything else. So I, I wanted to go over these two types of analysis. And when I have time, perhaps in a, in a future presentation, I'll be able to go a little bit more in depth uh, with specific circuits. So do we have any questions? Okay, no questions from this group. Let me go take a look on YouTube. I, th I think that was an excellent es uh, explanation of um, how you um, explain it to us. Um, the question right now on YouTube is why are you using an incorrect battery symbol? I think probably just for the sake of coming up with quick, quick graphics, we didn't have a lot of time to um, pull together a lot of graphics for the show. Um, demonstrating that there's a positive and a negative is something that, that was addressed during the presentation, so that just seemed like uh, meaningful symbols to use. Uh, did you have a different answer for that, Jeff? Well, the reason I use that symbol is because the symbol I used is for a generic voltage source. It doesn't need to be a battery. If I were specifically talking about a battery, I would use the battery symbol. But in this case, it really, any voltage source can would apply to what I was trying to explain. So because of that, I used a generic voltage source symbol rather than one specific to a battery. All right. Now, I hate to do this to you guys, but I actually brought a project. <laughs> and this is, this is the moment. This is the moment when I have to come out from behind my little curtain. Whew. Okay. Now then, we've talked about Arduinos tonight, and I had a sample project with an Arduino that I got some time ago. That is an Arduino Nano 3.0 from Gravitech. And this is a very simple counter, but it uses light to display the digits. And after it comes up here, uh, this is awful because you're not going to be able to see the colors. I used three RGB, I'm sorry, two RGB LEDs to represent different digits. And the way that we write different numbers is that R, G, and B represent ones when they're on. So, <laughs> so if I have a red light, I have one zero zero, <laughs> which means I have four, the number four. Um, if I have blue, I have one because RGB one. So this is essentially a binary counter that displays in octal. Nice. And what I mean by displays in octal is that I have seven different colors, uh, blue, green, teal, red, purple, brown, or red, brown, purple, I guess, and white. So I can count to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then the tens value, or the eight, 
is the second light, and it starts counting through the same. So these two colored LEDs can count to 63 in a way that you can just look at two colored LEDs and say, oh, that says 60. So one day we're going to have to do a, a nice long demo on understanding binary and, then we <laughs> and counting in binary. And when we do that, maybe we can uh, put another LED on that and have a clock out of it. Uh, that, and that, again, was just a very simple Arduino project using a, a sketch to count and a binary comparison saying, uh, is this number the current count that we're on? Does it have an 8's value or a 4's value or a 2's value? And turn on that particular color of that LED based on that value. Uh, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank very you very cool. much. <laughs> Jeff, you're typing words that I don't pronounce. Quadinary is basically the equivalent of binary, where you have four different states of logic rather than two. So because you're using RGB plus no light at all, each one of those LEDs represents a quadinary bit. So you basically have a two-quadinary system there. Thank you. Now I've learned something new based on a project that I did. That's, that's actually <laughs> kind of sad. There's, there's a little sadness there now. <laughs> hey, well, we're all here to help each other, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I didn't have this room full of geniuses, I'd have no idea that that's what I was doing. <laughs> well, all right. Do we have any other questions? I am taking a look at you, too. Ah, okay. Uh, UBU Warrior says that they prefer to read hex themselves, but they guess it'd be hard to differentiate the colors. Yeah, it, it's kind of hard to tell um, the teal from the blue or the green, especially in this kind of light. Um, when you're actually in the room with it, the colors are a little easier to tell, but that kind of granularity is, is just isn't there. You, you don't have a broad gamut that your eye can discern on these, and they're, they're, these aren't the very best RGB LEDs anyway, so uh, they're it's a little, you don't want to do more than a one and a zero on each of those colors. Well, theoretically, you could do half power to one or use pulse width modulation to get in between shades. Your eye just wouldn't be able to tell the difference. But I, I love that somebody out there likes to read in hex. Okay, what else do we have in here today? All right. All right, that sounds like an opportunity to start wrapping up. So, why do these guys, along with Stephen, leap through fire to bring you all the best uh, information like this? Because you can fix your electronics. Your local landfill and uh, the best place in your, your garage to keep things is piling up with things that you just don't use anymore or things that broke and you think are trash. They're not really trash. They're somebody else's treasure. They just need an opportunity to be cleaned up, fixed, and put out into the world or put back into use in your home. And I think that's kind of what Stephen's uh, whole point of pulling this thing together is, is uh, designed to see to, is that people are able to fix their own electronics. People are able to take care of themselves in that way and keep things out of the dump like that. Stephen, did you want to wrap, wrap up with any comments? Um, yeah, exactly. You know, like I said from the beginning, if, if people don't wake up and realize what's going on, you know, and, and we don't build our community and we don't gain as many members as we can, you know, and be able to push this out. So our, before, when I first started, it was just me by myself hanging out, trying to do what I can do, you know, explaining to people, look, you guys, we got to make it, we got to stop this, you know, it's, and now, look, you guys, I just want to take the time to say thank you, thank you, thank you for believing that we can make a change. Outstanding. Well, I want to thank everyone for taking the time to be here, and I hope you got something out of the show. In the future, we plan to do more educational presentations, practical demonstrations, and also open the floor to you for your project show and tells. I hope you'll tune in and bring a friend. Thank you, and good night.